So welcome back at the ThingsCon 2016 conference in Amsterdam, and uh, we have a new guest uh, and gave an inspiring talk earlier today. So uh, who are you and, uh, and what do you do? Uh, hello, my name is Amy Elliott. I'm the design director for Simply Secure. Simply Secure is a U.S.-based nonprofit that does open research and consulting, the focus on privacy, security, and ethics. That's an interesting topic, and I think uh, a topic that a lot of people talked about here on the, the things on a, a conference. But could you be could you elaborate a little bit more on what you do? Uh, yes. So my background is in user experience design, and uh, I come from a commercial consulting background. I um, worked for many years at Radio uh, in the United States in San Francisco, and was also in um, Silicon Valley as a research scientist doing R and D. And um, just in the, the past couple of years, m my personal and professional awareness of, of privacy and security challenges has exploded. And one of the problems we're trying to address is there are technical security solutions that are available for motivated people with technical skills to implement, but there isn't um, enough of a range of solutions that are um, design oriented and for a more mainstream audience. That means we at Simply Secure want to use user experience design to make security a positive thing that you, you move towards. And the stereotype is that security is like the, the kind of voice that says, no, no, you know, don't be naughty. And we're trying to reframe that and, and just show how exciting it can be to empower people. And security is a lot of times difficult as well. Yes, there, I mean, there are technical challenges. And um, I think looking at the pace at which the, many of the technical systems have changed, and when I say technical system, socio-technical system is probably more accurate. If we look at advertising driven revenue on the internet, that's a very complex system that there are technical elements. There's also elements of how people make money and are compensated. So we're looking very um, broadly. And in IoT, it's, it's exciting because there's hardware and software. And services that, that come together in some interesting ways. And uh, there are definitely technical challenges in, in keeping things secure. I already said it, there's a lot of things involved in IoT, and I talk to some people here, and I, I keep on hearing different uh, definitions of IoT, so I look forward to hearing yours. Okay, well, I mean, I think of um, the Internet of Things as a way of uh, understanding connected objects. So, um, if, if the earliest kind of visions of what the Internet meant was more interpersonal communication. And once we reached a kind of saturation point of, like, Many people have their own device, their own unique phone number, something like that. They're communicating. But what does it mean for me to have a relationship with tens or hundreds of devices? My car or appliances in my home or um, public transportation um, ticket checking systems. So all of these things are, are communicating with each other and collecting data about me in ways that could benefit me or could harm me. And becoming more intelligent. Yes, and becoming more intelligent. And, and I think that, um, especially someone that spent 20 years in San Francisco and is, is I'm very kind of enmeshed in a lot of the cultural values there, um, there's been so much emphasis on convenience and, and making everything seamless and easy and making it very easy to give your money to companies. I think it's a good moment to pause and consider some of the, the implications about um, maybe adding friction or making things more intentional is a, a more responsible choice. But that's, that's a hard sell, I suppose. If you go out and say to, say to ordinary consumers, we're going to make your life more difficult instead of easier. Um, well, yes, but I think that the incentives come in a bunch of different places. So um, just considering collecting uh, data about consumers, in the um, venture capitalist system, if a, a startup is um, gets funding, they are surrounded by advisors that are trying to encourage them to scale and make money. That's how they get their money back. And the, the purpose of that system is to do that. And the entrepreneurs are surrounded by advisors that say, collect every bit of data, and you can use that to, to make money. Data is this asset to monetize. And I think we're starting to see um, a shift 
towards data not being an asset to monetize, but data being a, a liability to protect against. And there's some, I mean, at the, the high level, very big companies, so for example, US telecommunications giant Verizon, um, wanting to renegotiate a deal for Yahoo, saying, okay, Yahoo has made some decisions, the security and privacy side that make them a less attractive uh, purchase. So at the this other side of very small startups, once the word starts to get out in the entrepreneur community that bad data hygiene and bad choices around security and privacy make them less attractive for acquisition, maybe that's something that can start to cause change. So we, do ten, we should do some, some naming and shaming and, and research all these companies to see if we can find leaks there and then uh, uh, companies will start collecting less data uh, and more, I, instead of more. I, naming and shaming is, is definitely, um, there are people that have used that quite effectively, for example, getting HTTPS like more broadly ad adopted. And, and as a designer, I like optimism, so I would rather reward people who are doing the right things and, and try to amplify those successes. And it's it's a, a big challenge because right now, um, I've said that the, the red X column of avoid these practices is very long. There, there are very many recommendations of, of problems to avoid. And the kind of green check or, or tick mark side of do this instead is and there are too few things there. So as a community, and I'm really glad to be you know, here at the ThingsCon meeting people, I, I want to add more choices to this please do this instead and help to share that community, share that knowledge within the community. But still then, how can, how can we do that in a more practical way? How can we, how can we do that? Well, um, any, uh, any kind of IoT service or, or product that has a login also needs a password recovery flow. And I think um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has um, you know, just recently, in the past few weeks, put out a guide saying, hey, these are some tips that you can, you can do to protect people. And some of the examples are things like um, allow the use of pseudonyms um, instead of having everyone work under their real name. It's a very small action, but there are concrete things there. I think, um, Getting familiar with the delete button, now might be a good time to um, delete data that you have, that you don't need, if you're concerned about it being um, subpoenaed by the government or, or someone coming after it. It, it can be a much, um, a much stronger position to say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have that data, instead of deciding like uh, how aggressive you will be making an ideological stand about not turning it over. So there, there, there are things, I mean, pushing for end-to-end -end encryption turned on by default, that's one you know, more technical thing, but a concrete thing. Pseudonyms, deleting, and of course, um, someone from a research background, don't collect data that you don't need. And I mean, all of these kind of website analytics and trackers, it's so much data. And I think that, um, like Cory Doctorow, someone that, that I admire that's an, an advisor to Simply Secure, has said we're at peak indifference to surveillance. And I certainly hope that that is true and that this mentality of collect all the data even with no plan and you can always decide what to do with it later. I hope that we're starting to see the end of that attitude and having people be more um, deliberate and intentional about only collecting what they need and having good processes in place for protecting it. Isn't, just came up to me, but it isn't, isn't the role of government not a problem in this situation? Because on the one hand they want to protect the civilians, uh, and they could play a role in it in, by imposing laws and, and mm -hmm. technology to use in, in order to protect citizens from all these malicious companies. Um, but on the other hand, they only want to do so if they can have the data themselves. Um, well, um, so stereotypically, and in San Francisco where I've spent most of my professional life, um, people are generally pretty excited about companies. They often have a high degree of trust or positive feelings in the Facebooks or Amazons or, or Googles of the world and are more skeptical about the, the government in the United States. And I've um, you know, recently moved to Berlin, which is a very different point of view, people having um, a lot of uh, skepticism, hostility, or, or anger around, towards companies like the Google, Amazon, Facebook, whatever, 
um, and people feeling much more confident and trusting in, in the government. And um, you know, I, I come out of design practice and, and don't identify myself as, a, as an activist or a, a, a political kind of policy oriented person, but I think looking at um, you know, recent election in the United States, that the United States government has a lot of um, surveillance infrastructure worldwide, and I think that now is, is a, a moment where people are starting to consider the implications of, of that. More people. There have been, there've been activists forever, and many people very clear and very passionate about this, but I, I think that um, the election has caused more people that maybe had just considered that, oh, that's something for another part of the world to think, oh, you know, maybe my data is at risk, and maybe it's time for me to have a different relationship with the government. True, but still, then, um, uh, the government could play a large role in this. It could impose uh, new legislation. Could could forbid certain mm -hmm. companies to certain business things that you sometimes see happening more over and more in, in, in countries like mm -hmm. Germany than mm -hmm. in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you still have a feeling that that they don't push that too much because uh, uh, they still want to follow people as well. Uh, yes, I think that the interplay between government and the policy and law and regulation and then what individual companies do is, is very complex. And I think that um, this is an area that I'm starting to look at more. Like, for example, what are we saying about where the server is and where data resides? And um, as a, a new... Um, person residing in Germany getting a new phone with a new number, I have different relationships and protections with some of the same companies that I did um, from my legacy relationships in the U.S. And even as someone that is has um, been very in, intentional about trying to, to you know, read, read these things and educate myself, it's very overwhelming. And I had seen um, an example that I, I can't quote the the specifics, but it was, it was an estimate that um, in a market, for example, Germany, I'm not sure if the case was Germany, but um, looking at how many uh, terms and conditions a person uh, agrees in a year, the number of hours it would take to actually read all those documents was staggering. Multiplied by the person, like hours in the country, there's this idea that, okay, our country would be needing to spend like hundreds of thousands of hours like reading these documents. And we know that that doesn't happen. So what are we saying? We, we've created from, it, from a user experience design point of view, there are conventions around check yes to accept and download and update. And we know that no one's reading it. We know that people aren't understanding it. Does that mean that it's actually a legally binding contract? If you know the person could not possibly have read it, and can't understand what they're agreeing to. And, and that's a case where design and the law are just not connecting to reality as it's practiced by a lot of people. More, moreover, that uh, it seems to be designed deliberately in a way that uh, you cannot read and understand it. Uh, and secondly, you don't have an option because you can either accept it and use it or do not or accept not. it and, and not use it. And, and, and then not being able to use it is, is too big a, a loss so people will easily accept it without knowing consequences. So, so how, how did it impact your behavior uh, in your personal life? Um, well, it's been interesting for me. I have a new German um, identity that I've created, like new new logins, new accounts. I have a new email address, a new phone number, and um, my um, German language skills are, are at a very much beginner level. So it's interesting to see how... Uh, the amount of German language spam and, and things that I'm collecting that I can't even really read or understand and I'm getting recommended for products that I don't understand what they're for. So that's been um, from a, uh, an ethnographic or anthropological point of view an, an interesting point of, of um, entry into this world. But I mean, when I think about my behavior, um, I've been much more aware of like social sharing and um, what the possible good sides are um, to participating voluntarily in, in a network like Facebook, and I have a much clearer sense of what um, what the harms are. And uh, there there needs to be a different conversation around what those trade offs are. I think.
he gave a talk here uh, at Thingscon as well, and then there's a lot of inspiring and, and positive uh, uh, people working on all sorts of new projects. But what, yes. what did you tell them, or what would you like to to, to, to I mean, share with them? I think that um, privacy is a great opportunity for user experience designers to, to lead, to, to lead their companies, to lead their organizations, and to use human-centered design values to make a, a more ethical, responsible, um, and beneficial technology. And the, the highest level of the thing that I'd like to communicate is that you don't need to be a cryptographer with technical skills to participate in security. It's important and there's, there's a place for everyone. And the design disciplines, researchers, content strategists, illustrators, I mean, there, there's so many needs that I really hope that more people get inspired to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you.